Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. India is known as Incredible India. It's 1.3 billion people, 1,600 official languages, 330 million gods. And each home has about six or seven deities they worship from their forefathers. 400 million people have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Imagine the population of the United States is more than that. In India, a country like India, people just have no hope in their life. So I felt if people know the Lord, there will be some hope in their life. So that's why we called it Hope for Today. Hope for Today has three approaches to reach the people. One is the compassion component to the ministry. The Bible says when Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. And India has a lot of street children, a lot of poor people, a lot of widows begging on the street, hunger. We need to do something for these people. As we're doing that, we also felt that we need to help people to become good leaders. We met a lot of Christians, a lot of Christian leaders, pastors, and uh, we felt if uh, they could be trained to become good leaders so they can do the ministry too. It's not just giving people a daily meal, like giving them a fish, but if you teach them how to fish, uh, it goes a long ways. So we started investing our life in training people into leadership. And not only that, but we tell them to go and teach others. He says that he wants us to go deeper with him. So compassion, leadership, and then we finally felt it's very important for us to do church planting, helping people form groups where they can worship, pray, and have a gatherings together. Amen to that. And our whole world needs hope for today, right? Uh, especially, we just continue to hear evidence of that in the news. Um, and so that makes me particularly happy for today and for Peter Pereira being with us again here at FaithBridge. Before I introduce him, let me just say welcome. Glad that you're here. If you're in Center Court East or West or at the Woodlands campus or online, wherever it is that you are here, uh, we're glad that you are here. So about 10 years ago, I think it was, I got to meet Peter and Esther, and to hear about the ministry that they do in India. And I just felt so inspired, just all the way down to the bottom of my soul. And it was uh, right about that point, Pastor Dan uh, was also coming into a connection with them and began forming the partnership that we have with hope for today, and even a number of faith bridgers have gone and been a part of the ministry over there. And so I think it's just the third or fourth or fifth time maybe that Peter has preached to us. It's always a treat and a blessing, and I told him after the earlier service, it just fills my soul up to hear him, and uh, I think you're gonna have that same experience today. And so it's just a joy to welcome our friend Peter Pereira. Would you help me in doing that right now? Pastor Ken, thank you so much for the partnership and what you are doing for the Lord. Of course. Thank you. Locally, internationally. You have not been to India, but you have sent teams. Mm -hmm. And because of that, many people have been blessed. Thousands of lives have been touched. And many leaders have come out of the ministry to do great things for the Lord. The Indian people would love to honor you if you had been there, but since they're not, there are thousands of people. And to honor in our culture in India, they have sent a stole kind of a thing for you 
to honor you with this. So let me please have a privilege of doing this as a pastor. Thank you so much. God Thank bless you. you very much. Thank you, Thank you brother. Thank Love you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Preach to us. Thank you. What a privilege this morning. I want to thank God for giving me this honor to be here and to be part of this great worship time together at Faith Bridge. Um, God has been moving in a mighty way in many parts of the world, especially in the region of India. And gospel is what it is changing the lives. Gospel is not just uh, information to people. But gospel has the power of transformation. When you listen to the word of God, gospel comes into your life. Something is bound to happen. You know, when you listen to a gospel message, life is changed for better. I've met thousands of hundreds of people that testify. I'm, I, I've heard them firsthand say that. You know, one of the ladies who came to the conference and she said, you know, I used to have so many deities in my home an average of six or seven deities. But she said, when I heard the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, she said, my life has been transformed. I see the difference as night and day. And then she said this to me, you know, my community is persecuting me, but pastor tell me, how can I leave this glorious gospel or the light and go back to darkness? I cannot. I would rather be persecuted, but I cannot let go this glorious gospel. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is not just, like I said earlier, information, but God does something in our lives. And I heard this story, you know, a couple of years ago. Uh, in Africa, some parts of Africa, in a jungle, there was a man who was just uh, reading a book, was just quietly away from everyone and reading this book. And a tourist from New York with two, three cameras and typical hat walking around and caught many pictures. He was taking pictures, chick, 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 chick. He took all the pictures, took the picture of this guy. And then he was curious. He walked up to him and he says, what are you reading? The man said, I'm reading the Bible. Oh, this guy said, oh, I'm from USA. We don't believe in such things, you know. You need to not read this book. It's an old-fashioned book. And the man said, the African guy looked at him. He says, sir, if I wasn't reading the book, you would be in that boiling pot over there. <laughs> The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is not just a kind of a good word. It is a word that God says, I will transform. That's the power of the gospel. And to summarize, you know, John 3, 16, most of us can quote that. For God so loved the world. It, you know, it's immeasurable, immeasurable. His love is so immeasurable, no one can measure it. When people quote John 3, 16, one preacher said, you know, I looked at that text and he said, I have made... 600 outlines of that one verse. And some of the commentators have said this, you know, they said, you know, they look at the message of the gospel in uh, John 3, 16, they said, this text has been called everyone's text. One uh, writer writes and he says, you know, the summary of the Old Testament can be put into John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that if you believe, if you believe in him, you shall have eternal life. Luther says it well. He says, this is the treasure of the church. You know, all this is good unless you make it personal to your life. You know, please, I mean, listen to me, brothers, sisters. Many people have said, oh, it's a good word, it's a good message. Unless you make this message personal to your life, nothing really happens. Otherwise, it will stay as an information. But the Bible says, with the gospel of the glorious gospel, in mere words, no one, I don't think I can explain what is gospel. Just in mere words, it is hard to explain the love of God, even from that single text of John 3, 16. It's very hard. While we were still enemies, the Bible says God had mercy on us. While we were dead in our sins, the Bible says God came and loved us. Jesus Christ came as a perfect being. And the Bible says he loved us. No matter what we have done in our lives, Whatever you have done in your life, how bad it may be, the people may reject you, but God says, I love you. I forgive you. I love you. That's why this is the glorious gospel, not just information that people should take it and leave it. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, I'll read it for you. He says, for he was made sin for us. He knew no sin 
but he was made sin for us. And the Bible says that his righteous garment was put upon us. Our sin was put upon him. What a love of God. Mere words cannot explain away this glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Luke 2.10, every Christmas we read this, and I'll read from this uh, living Bible translation. He says, he says, I bring you, the angel comes, don't be afraid. The angel says, I bring you the most joyful news ever announced. I love that translation because for this verse, right for this verse, he says, I bring you the most joyful news ever announced and it is for everyone. Only the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is for everyone. And then Luke also tries to summarize it or explain the gospel, but it's hard for anyone to summarize it. And he says in 22, 24, he says, Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane, we know that. When he was praying before going to the cross, in the garden of Gethsemane, the Bible reminds us he was praying in such agony, he says. The sweat fell to the ground like drops of blood. And this was because of our sin. He was taking our pain, our sorrow, our sin, our wrongs upon himself because he loves us. Even before he went to the cross, I and mean, cross was really most painful death for anyone. And especially for the one that has done nothing. He knew no sin, but he was put up on the cross for you and for me. That's the glorious gospel. And let me summarize how John tries to finish up in John 21, 25. I'll read this for you. Jesus also did many other things. John, John is trying to close the gospel of John. And he says, you know, you know the beginning. In the beginning, he says, chapter 1, he says, in the beginning. And now he begins to close the chapter, the book that he's writing. And he says, Jesus also did many other things. And he says, if they were all written down, I suppose the whole world could not contain the books that would be written. How can you describe gospel in just mere words? It's God's love for us. This is gospel. He has come and taken the darkness from our lives and he has given us his glorious light to us. Amazing. This is God's love. In all the other religions that you see, man or human beings are running and looking for God. I've met people that made pilgrimages. They've gone, they spent money, they went to this place, that place, and then they would come back and I talked to a few of them and I asked them, after the pilgrimage was done, did you find what you were looking for? And they will sadly put their heads down. They say, no, I'm still looking for it. That's what the religions of the world would do. But Christianity says, God says to us, the gospel says to us that he is running after us. When you look at Luke chapter 15, you know the story of the prodigal son. Now you have to understand this story from where it was written. It was kind of an Eastern setting in the village and the son rebels against his father and he says, give my money, give my property and I'm gonna go and live the way that I wanna live. And he leaves it, that broke the father's heart. When the son leaves, and after he lives, and I'm not giving all the details, but I'm explaining to you the gospel, trying to explain to you the gospel, what it really means. The son comes to senses. He comes back and he says, I would better, I'm better off living in my father's house as a servant than living where I'm living right now. So he turns around and he comes back and he's on his way to his father's house. And this is what the Bible says. The father looked at the son far away. He wasn't even close enough. While he was far away, the Bible says, the father ran to the son. In Eastern culture, the fathers don't run to the sons. That's what you need to know. The fathers don't go and hug the children in Eastern culture. But here's the love of God, the grace of God that is coming. And, and in other versions it says when the son met the father, the son is trying to tell the daddy, oh, I've done wrong, I messed up my life, you know I'm wrong. But, but the father doesn't give the chance for the son to say that. He's just kissing the son. In Eastern cultures, fathers don't kiss the son. They just hug. But here's the father kissing, and the son is trying to say, Daddy, I met, met, no son, I'm just so happy you're, Daddy, I messed up my life. Son, I'm so glad you're here, and, and just let me kiss you, just kiss you. That's the love and the grace of God. 
That's what the glorious gospel means, that God is coming to us. Vile as we are, as wrong as we have been, people have thrown stones at you. People have put you away. But God comes and embraces you with this glorious gospel. That is the mission for our lives, is to say, when I receive this glorious gospel, when I receive this forgiveness, my call is to do something for the kingdom. Missions is a response to the love and the grace of God. You know, someone said this well. Every heart without Jesus Christ is a mission field. And every heart that has Jesus Christ is a missionary. Missions doesn't mean, missionaries don't mean they're special categorized people. All of us that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ have a mission in our lives. All of us have a purpose in our life to do something in response to this glorious gospel. The glorious gospel, while we were yet sinners, the Bible says, while you were yet doing wrong, the love of God comes to you, runs to you, embraces you, and says, I love you. I don't love what you're doing, but I love you. How many lives are being destroyed because they don't understand the grace and the love of God? People think they have to earn the love of God. In, in our life's journey, many people want to earn. They do something so they can earn love. God's grace says, no, you don't have to do anything but just to say that you believe, and I'm here to love you. And that's the love of God that comes to us and embraces us. God says, I love you. I forgive every wrong, every sin that you have done is forgiven. I, I read a story of a, of a Spanish father who decided to reconcile with his son uh, when he, the son runs away from home and he goes and lives in Madrid. The father, <clears throat> in a moment of remorse, takes a big ad in the newspaper and he says this, Paco, meet me at Hotel Montana, noon Tuesday. All is forgiven, Papa. When the father arrived at the square in the hopes of meeting his son, he found 800 Pacos waiting. <laughs> Was the name famous or the every heart is looking for forgiveness? That's the glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They're looking. People are, are wanting this glorious gospel to say, Someone loves me. God, the universe that was created, that father, that God loves us. And he says, I forgive you. And in response, this is what uh, Paul writes. He says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For this is the power of God. The gospel really is not just an information, not just an idea, but it is the very power of God that changes the life inside and out. Living in darkness, he says, when you receive the gospel, your life is changed. Missions is the response to this glorious gospel. In 2 Corinthians 5, 15, Paul writes, he says, He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. You know what the Bible is saying to us? When we receive this glorious gospel, we ought not to be living just for ourselves because we need to now think of others. Everyone may not go to the mission field, but the mission field sometimes is your very family. And one of the most difficult places is the family as a missionary. <laughs> Very difficult field to show that love and the grace within the family. The challenges that we have the family. But that could be a mission field. Some are called to go. Some are called to stay here. Some are called locally. But wherever we are, the glorious gospel reminds us mission is everyone's call. Mission is everyone's call. And this is our response. So 316 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. 317 says, God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Friends, many people do not understand the gospel. They don't understand that. It is not some works. It is simply saying, I trust and I believe in God that he has taken my sin away. It's not, you have, you, you know, there is no price that you can pay. Because he already paid the price for us on the cross of Calvary. That's the glorious gospel. So when you see 316, don't forget there is 317 right behind it. It says, reminding us, God sent his son. God sends you to, tomorrow you go back to works. Some are teachers, some are doctors, some are mechanics. Whatever you do, you are on the mission. <laughs> you're on the mission. You work in a grocery store, you're on the mission field. You are, you're exhibiting the grace and the love of God. Whatever you do, 
Sometimes you can say, sometimes you cannot say, but people need to see the Christ in us all the time. That is the response for us in the missions. Uh, if you uh, remember the story, in a mission is what you respond to the gospel. Samaritan woman at the well, beautiful story. The Samaritan woman, uh, you know, she know that she, you, she comes to the well in the afternoon because she was living a wrong lifestyle. The community rejected her. She was a very lonely woman. The life that she was living, she's still not happy. And so she comes to get the water. And there was Jesus Christ all by himself just waiting for this one person. Sometimes the mission is just for that one person that you're called to. And Jesus shows that. He's waiting for this woman. She comes to the water. And Jesus has a beautiful conversation. And just a conversation to remind who he was and kind of it brings it to light. And this is what he says to her. He says, you come to this water, but he says this, John 4, 13. He says, anyone, watch that word, anyone who drinks this water, this water will soon become thirsty again. In other words, what he was saying was, anyone who comes to this world and drinks this water, the things of the world, the money of this world, the position of the world, the power of this world, you will become thirsty again. And I like what it says. This translation says, Jesus says, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty. Not one week later, but you'll become thirsty again because the things of this world will never satisfy us. John D. Rockefeller, who started Standard Oil Company, was the first billionaire, the richest man in USA, first richest billionaire. And he was, he's still considered as one of the richest men, uh, richest person in the history. When a reporter asked him this question, how much money is enough? How much money is enough, Mr. Rockefeller? His response was, just a little more. Just a little more. The thirst, the thirst is not enough. Sometimes, you know, just a little bigger house. Is that enough? No. You want something bigger. You buy a new car, something bigger. You buy something else, something else. And Jesus said this so well. He says, you will soon thirst again. And when this woman receives the gospel, in 13 he says, in 14 verse he says, but those who drink the water that I will give, never thirst again. If you receive me, if you drink the water that I'm going to give you, you will not thirst again. Your life will be satisfied. Your heart is empty. You're, there's a vacuum in your life because you have not understood the glorious gospel message. Once you receive this gospel message, life is changed. And she listens to the message. And then she says this, Please, sir, the woman said, please, sir, give me that water. Transformation begins by you saying, yes, I need that new life. I need this glorious gospel. That is the beginning of transformation. And you see, life begins to change. And what she did was she, she goes back with confidence. Well, you know, she goes back to the very people that rejected her. The scripture says she left everything and she ran and she said, come and see, come and see. He touched my life. He touched my life. His words changed me. Come and see, come and see. I wish even 20% of our churches who just get up Monday morning onwards and think they're on a mission because I believe in this glorious gospel. I'm going to show and share the love of Jesus Christ. Even if 20% of us just take it seriously and think that you are a missionary because you have received this gospel, my friends, people's lives can be touched. She goes back to the people. A new confidence in her. A new confidence. The people that rejected her. The people that would throw stones at her. People that avoided her. She went back to them and she said, my life has changed. Something truly happens when you believe in this glorious gospel. I heard a story of Dr. Billy Graham um, he was, when he was starting his ministry, he was in a small town. He was preaching at a Baptist church. And uh, as he was in the town, he was looking for a post office. He looks at a young boy and he says, he asks him for the directions for the post office. So the young boy said, yes, sir, go straight, make a left, make another right. There is the post office. And Billy Graham said, thank you very much. And Billy Graham told him, if you'll come this evening to the Baptist church, you can hear me telling everyone how to get to heaven. The boy looked at him and he says, I don't think I'll be there because you don't even know the post office. 
What am I saying to you? When you receive the glorious gospel, you have this new confidence in your life. The Bible says the Samaritan woman left everything, went back, and the scriptures, if you read it, she said that they left it and ran back to the village telling everyone. Can you imagine? The very people that rejected you, the very people that put you aside, now you're running to them and telling them, he has touched my life. Something happened in my life. Come and see. Come and see the, our church. Come. We are having some special program. Come and see what is happening in our church. Just come and see. Come and see. And God will touch their lives. I want to just tell you what happens when you receive this glorious gospel. You will have a new identity. There is a new identity that comes upon your life. I met a few people just a couple of weeks ago, blind people. I was teaching them. And when I was teaching them, this is the new identity he has in his life. I met this pastor who was rejected when he wanted to be a pastor. The people told him that you cannot be a pastor because you're blind. Go back. And he said, no, 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 no. I have a new identity. I want to be a pastor. Yes, this very blind man. He stood with us and he says, you know, pastor, everyone rejected us. The, the seminary I went, they said, you cannot be a pastor. I went to the Bible college. They said, no, you cannot be a pastor. But he said, this is what happened to me. The glorious gospel did not shut me down, but it gave me a new identity. Whenever you feel in your life, this is the end. When you see a period on your life, when you feel like this is the end, you think this is the hopeless situation, and someone says to you, this is the end. This is a full stop. This is a period on your life. The glorious gospel comes to that period, and just by a stroke, Jesus changes it, and he says, I comma. I make this period a comma to be continued. That's the glorious gospel. Until he says it's finished, nothing is finished. That's the glorious gospel. New identity. This, this pastor said, I have a new identity. Then I, we met some more people that were, began to sense a new role in their lives. They were bl blind people. All these people that were blind, they came to the conference. They were all blind. Now they have a new role. I love this picture because, you know, all these People are blind. Blind leading the blind, we say. But when you receive the Lord Jesus Christ in your life, there is something inside of you that you have a new vision, a new role in their life. All these people came to the conference and they said, now we have a new role. We want to tell about Jesus. And every one of them has come from a non-Christian background. Every one of them heard this glorious gospel that touched their lives, changed their lives. Now they're saying, we have a new role. This young lady, in this new role of her life, when we met her, she said, you know, I'm blind, but now I have a new role. I'm a Sunday school teacher. Esther and I were amazed. She said, really? You are a Sunday school teacher? Yes. And she showed the lesson that she prepares in Braille format. And she said, this is what I, and she's struggling to read that and, uh, and just sort of run her fingers through. This is what I teach. A new role in her life. Nothing is finished until God says it is finished. So she started a Sunday school ministry. God is so good to all of us. You begin to have a new identity. You begin to have a new role. That is what God does. And then God gives us a new calling in our lives. I want you to meet Sister Sabita. She's from a non-Christian background. Her brother came to faith in Christ. And then the brother went and told the sister... Now, Sabita came to Christ, and that's how she is all the time. You know, just a big smile on her face. Since Jesus Christ, the glorious gospel became part of her life. She said, now this is who I am. I have a new calling in my life. She's physically challenged. She was born with polio, and that's how she grew up, and she walks around with a stick. That's what she does. And then she also tells the story of this glorious gospel to other people. She goes and tells the story to other people. That's why she was discipling the other young ladies. And they go and tell the story to others. Doing this, Sabita also goes and baptizes because women baptize women in that culture. So she took the women and she was even baptizing in that river with all the physical challenges she was baptizing. New calling in her life. And she understood the ministry. Doing this, this Sabita has planted more than 40 house churches with all the physical challenges. 
Because she believed in this glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, 2 Corinthians reminds us, 17 says, you are a new person in Christ. Verse 18 says, God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. God has given us a task, each one of us. In 17, you become a new creature. But in 18, he reminds us that you have a new calling in your life. That is to help people See the love of God through your actions, through your love, through your life. That's what God does to us. Not only that, but God begins to give us a new desire in our hearts. Because now you receive this glorious gospel, you have a new desire. Faith Bridge was there with us a couple of months ago. And uh, we were doing a conference for the young people, history makers, and national conference. As we are doing this conference... In one of the days, I was watching for the young ladies who were coming daily to the lunch. And one of those days, these young ladies did not come. And these three young ladies, I kind of did not see them uh, during the lunch session. So I asked the other girls, I said, where are they? And they said, you know, Pastor, these three young ladies feel a new desire in their hearts. Now, usually when young people come to the pastor, they will say, Pastor, would you pray for my job? Would you pray for a partner in my life? Would you pray that God would bless? But these young three ladies, what they said was, Pastor, we are fasting and we are praying because the next village has not heard the gospel. A new desire. And then I called them forward, and one of the faith bridgers I asked them to pray for these young ladies, and we began to pray for them. That was the scene. Those three young ladies said, we have a new desire in our lives. Not only God gives you a new desire, when you truly, gospel is not information. My brothers, my sisters, I want to tell you, it is not just a good word, good message. But when you truly believe, the transformation begins to happen in your life. You begin to see a new identity. You begin to see a new role. You begin to see a new call in your life. You begin to see new desires in your life. And then you begin to see new priorities come to your life. I was working as an engineer, making pretty good money, really good money, big Fortune 500 company. And my desire was to become the next in that line, the head of the engineering department. I was kind of an engineer, and I was working on my MBA, hoping I could get and do what everybody else dreams of. God began to speak to my heart. He says, no, that is not your purpose in life. I have a mission for you. And God said, you will preach the word. And I said, Lord, I think you have the wrong number. (laughs) First of all, I cannot stand in public. I cannot meet people. I cannot talk. You know, all these three things are against me, and I, I can't do that. But Lord, here's what it is. I'm making good money as an engineer. I'll give my tithe to you. And you know what? I'll be right behind the pastor. How far behind? I didn't tell him, but behind the pastor. (laughs) God said, no, I don't need any of those things. I just want you. And the rest is history. When I surrendered my life to Christ, new priorities in my life was to go and tell the people of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to meet this beautiful young lady. Every Christmas she comes to me. She just invites me and says, you're preaching for the blind people. Every Christmas she would come and she organizes. That's her ministry. She's not a preacher and she just goes and organizes two to three hundred blind people and uh, she just does that and she calls me to preach. First, first year she came, gave me the invitation. Second year she said, you're coming to preach. She didn't ask me if my dates are open. <laughs> she said, you're coming to preach. And third time she came back, my heart moved and I said, Nagamani is her name. And I said, sister, I want to give you a gift as a braille watch or a typewriter. What do you want me to give? That's the picture that you just saw. The next day she said, I'll come back the next day. She came back to the office the next day. We were all preparing for Christmas. Christmas is a big thing for all of us. And we had some monies, about $600, $800 set aside to spend on the staff, to spend for ourselves. We had that money. And we kept it and we were saying. So she came that time and I asked her, Nagamani, what do you want? She said, she calls me uncle. In India, that's what it is. When you start getting a little gray, they call you uncle. So with love. And I said, yes, Nagamani, what can I do for you? And she said, uncle, I heard if you put that money in the bank, you receive some interest. Is that right? I said, yeah. But I wasn't giving you a big chunk of money, just a small amount. She says, uncle, I don't want that money. You please keep that money and 
take that interest. Every year, I want to tell the blind people about Jesus. I don't want that gift. I called my staff and I said, you know, she's not blind. We are blind. She can see. She has the right priorities in her life. We spend so much time on this and that for ourselves. But this blind girl that you and I think she's blind, she knows her priorities. She says, I want my blind friends to hear about this glorious gospel. That became part of her mission for life. Friends, this gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ compels us to go. It just compels us. If you're really sensitive, you will know that you may not be a preacher, you may not sing like others, you may not go on the mission field, but wherever you are, love of God compels you to do something. I had one time, one of the Freight Bridges team that came, and uh, this was a young lady, very sophisticated. I knew that the moment she got off the flight, and she happened to sit in my Jeep, and the driver just took off from the airport, panic started, and she began to see things that she wasn't supposed to see, but that's what you see, and she was really wondering what was going on. But on the mission field, she was not a preacher to say, she didn't come for that purpose. But the Indian missionary that took her, this is what he told about her. She, she said, sir, she went to every child. She had about 200 kids that she was reaching to. And every kid, she said, she only could touch a little child. She bent down, look into the eyes of the little kid. She says, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. And the Indian missionary said, she said that to every kid, as if she was preaching to the kid, and she looked in the eyes and told them. I don't know what will happen to the kids when they grow up, but I bet you they will not forget that one American came and touched them and said, Jesus loves them. That's Becca McDowell from your church. Just touch. Just touch. Some may not do much, but that's the mission for our calls in our life. Mission is not about a checkbox. I went to a mission trip. I did this. I did this in my community. No, it's not a checkbox. It's about a transformation that happens in our life. There is no obligation for it. But you say, God, I received this glorious message. What must I do? My friends, let me ask you, did you really have this transformational experience? Did you experience this transformation? Or is it just coming to church? I like it. I like the music. I like the preaching. Please, I plead with you today. Don't just go back and say, I heard it. Let this be a message to your heart and say, you know, it transformed my life. I have a mission in my life. I don't have to be titled as a missionary. I don't have to go other places like others do. That's their call. But wherever I am, friends, can you imagine? The God who created this universe calls you to be active in this world as his missionary there is a purpose in our life. And I pray this morning that you would consider and think deeper and say, it, it's just not good, but it is good only when you say, yes, transformation happened in my life. And you will experience the difference. Let us pray. Our gracious, loving God, we thank you we thank you because you loved us while we were yet sinners. You came to us. While we were in deep darkness of our lives, when there was no one to love us, you loved us. When there was no one reaching to us, you have reached us. You have touched my life, Lord. You have touched thousands and millions of lives while they were deep in their own world and sin. While they were in darkness, you brought this transformational power to us and you touched us and you changed our lives. Father, thank you so much. And I pray that, oh God, that many as we walk out from here, we will not just say it was good, but oh God, our lives have been transformed. And then, oh Lord, you give a purpose for us to live, to be a mission person. Wherever we are, missions, oh God, is a response of your love for us. That you died for our sins. When we were wrong, you touched us and you blessed us. We give you thanks. We give you praise. We give you glory. 
In Jesus' name we ask and we pray, Lord. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hello and welcome to Postscript. My name is Adam McIntyre and I am joined today by Peter Pereira who just preached a message on the gospel and how our going out on mission is in response to the gospel. Peter, thank you so much you. for being here with us today. Uh, so one of the questions that I think um, people would be interested in is um, kind of examining the differences between the church in India and the church in, in America. Um, what are some of the big differences you've noticed, maybe culturally, in the way we practice, uh, things like that? Yeah, there is a lot of difference in the two settings of this world, the way that faith is practiced. Sure. And uh, I think the issues and the problems will be the same because what is happening in India is the traditional churches are not making a big moves. Mm. While the new churches that have come on scene that are more inclusive, more non-traditional, nothing wrong with being a traditional church, sure. but when we forget to uh, include other peoples in their group, we're missing a whole lot of people. Yeah. And so the church in India is growing the same way that's growing here, that is non-traditional okay. and helping people to see that. I've seen that with my eyes where there is uh, less of traditions. In a sense, tradition is not bad, but when people don't have an opportunity to understand tradition, we just give them the gospel and the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they are just taking that message and sharing with other friends. Mm -hmm. United States, I see the same similar struggles that are happening. And also, I think sometimes uh, the comfort level sometimes causes us a little more uh, to be casual with sure. our faith in the in, in United States. That's what I see. But overseas, uh, faith is so serious. It's their life. Okay. This glorious gospel message for them is life. Sure. There is no like Monday to Saturday, I'm busy, I'm this. No, no, they take it right. very seriously because they know that when God sent His Son to die on the cross for their sins, it's a very serious issue. They take it very personal. Yeah. And then the response to that is getting involved, right. doing something for God. Sure. That's the way. In the United States, I think people categorize it. Mm -hmm. We have we catalog them. Right. And we say, well, missions is for missionaries. For us, we will go Sunday worship. But I think all of us have a mission in our lives. When you have truly received this message, something is bound to happen. Absolutely. So in India, when people become Christian, it's completely transformative. It takes control of every area of their life. Whereas here, you see, to put it bluntly, almost as a hobby for a lot of Christians where they practice when, in their spare time, uh, maybe Wednesday nights at Bible study or Sunday morning for worship. But then other than that, Christ hasn't really taken hold of the rest of their lives. Uh, so I guess my question would be, for those Christians that maybe they, they say they follow Jesus, they say they've accepted the gospel, but they do not feel compelled to uh, be on mission, whether it's overseas or, or here in our own community, um, how would you challenge those Christians um, to kind of give up, uh, to, to let Jesus take hold and, and to um, feel that urge to go out on mission and to spread the gospel even here? in our own culture, in our own community. Yeah. Let me give you one example of what happens in India when people come to faith in Christ, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. They become so strong in their faith. I'll give you an extreme example. They're willing to die. Hmm. And they know that when they do public confession, public baptism, right. they are declaring to that community, I'm willing to die. Hmm. And some of them, they may not be immediately persecution start off to kill them, but they are isolated from their friends, from their families, and they're daily bombarded by now you're doing something new. But in fact, the person is not doing anything new. The person has just discovered themselves that God cares about them. God loves them. And they take it very seriously. Somehow God, the Holy Spirit, connects with them. Now, when you come to uh, United States and faith practice in the United States is much of a Sunday another event for us. Right. And that's the, for me, kind of a 
a kind of a tragedy for people to understand. It's a Sunday thing for us to do. So Monday to Tuesday, I have these practices, that practice, which is fine. But even at the practices, you still carry your faith with you. Right. And there is nothing wrong in displaying your faith in some action, sure. some words. Now, I think the fear sometimes I think the people here have is, I have to know the whole Bible, mm. or if what people ask me questions. Really, those are not the things that we ought to be concerned about. I sure. think if you can share your story, That's right. I cannot refuse your story. Right. I cannot argue with your testimony. I cannot tell you this is right or wrong because what you believe, what you've experienced, it's your story. That's right. yeah. And if people can start telling their stories just in a simple format, you don't have to answer. I don't have all the answers. You don't have all the No one in the world has answers for everything, right. but God does. And in his time, he will open the answers to us. But for now, I think when I go home from Monday through Saturday, wherever I am, if I can just show that I'm a follower of Christ, right. you don't have to preach. Right. You don't have to shake people up. But even in actions, if they can do that. One of the things sometimes is challenging is many times when I go to the restaurants, when I eat, I see so many people just order food and eat. My heart aches because there are so many people who don't have food. That's right. They have to wait sometimes for days. Mm -hmm. And here sometimes we don't even thank God for the food. Yeah. That's my prayer. Right. Do you understand what I'm saying? Absolutely. That when you believe in God, what is wrong in just thanking Him for the food that He has given? It's not your right. right. There are people that are born on the other side of the track. They know what food means. Right. the value of food. And when we get it so easily, my prayer and hope is that we could just take a moment to thank Him. Right. You don't have to preach. Right. Right? Absolutely, yeah. So that's what I'm saying. For us to be a little more, I don't want you to uh, say the word, a little more aggressive in a mm. positive way. Sure. To say yeah. that I'm, I'm pausing to thank God for the food. Absolutely. And, and there are other yeah. Christians I've seen who have done it. They do that in the restaurants and other places. But I think as Christians, if I'm have a relationship with the Lord, I need to show that. He's watching me. While He's giving me this, I need to say, thank you, Lord. Just those two words right. means a lot. Absolutely. Very good. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, so for someone that is here, that is looking to maybe get involved in your ministry, whether that's locally or in India, what advice would you have for them to get involved? My hope and prayer is that everyone that is listening to us would be involved in some ways mm -hmm. in touching lives, whether it's here, overseas, or anywhere. Sure. But somewhere we need to have a touch mm -hmm. in this world because he says that you are the salt and the light of this earth. Yep. And it doesn't take a lot of salt to help us taste right. something. <laughs> so a little bit of is enough. Right. I think all of us should do the little bit that you're called to do. Right. And if you want to come overseas, if you want to work in South Asia, I think Pastor Dan Slagle is the right person okay. and he's got so many resources, right. he can guide in the right way. So I would say connect with him and he will help to organize and see what he can do. Great. So contact Pastor Dan yes. Slagle. Yes. Absolutely. Well, Peter, thank you so much thank for being you. here with us today. Thank you for your message. And yes. thank you all for tuning in. We will see you all next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.